Shane Sharp again, and this is the lecture on the social psychology of aggression. A man, after one too many drinks, punches another man in a bar for accidentally stepping on his foot. A woman makes up a particularly nasty rumor and spreads it through word of mouth and over the internet about her ex-romantic partner. A mugger stabs a man during the course of a robbery, taking his wallet and leaving him for dead. A husband constantly tells his wife that she's worthless and that no one loves her. A woman shoots a pistol at a man who cut her off in traffic. What do these, all these situations have in common? Well, they are all examples of aggressive behavior. Aggression is the flip side of pro-social behavior, the topic of the last series of lectures. While pro-social behavior is behavior that helps others, in general, aggression is behavior that hurts others. Although what aggression is seems straightforward, social psychologists say it isn't so simple. For example, is aggression any behavior that hurts another person? If this is the case, then surgeons who perform heart surgery on a person who unfortunately dies on the operating table because of an operating error would be acting aggressively since they performed actions that hurt another person. Also, what if a person expects the potentially hurtful behavior from the other person? For, for example, a boxer that steps into a boxing ring knows that the other boxer in the ring is going to hit him as hard as he can and try to knock him out. Is boxing in a boxing ring then an example of aggressive behavior? Most social psychologists would say no. Boxing is not technically aggressive behavior. It is aggressive-like, but it is not aggressive behavior. Also, what if a person intended to hurt a person, but actually didn't? For example, is it considered aggressive behavior if a person throws a punch at somebody, but his punch misses the target? Even though the behavior didn't end up hurting anybody, most people would still consider this aggressive behavior. With these considerations in mind, social psychologists have come up with the following definition of aggression. Aggression is any behavior intended to harm another person that the other person does not expect and wishes to avoid. According to this definition of aggression, not all behavior that ultimately harms another person is considered aggressive. The surgeon whose patient dies on the operating table was, according to this definition, not acting aggressively. Also, according to this definition, when the other person expects and does not wish to avoid the potentially hurtful behavior, the behavior is not aggressive. Thus, a boxing match is not an example of aggressive behavior, since both boxers are fully aware that the other person is going to behave in ways that could potentially hurt them. Also, according to this definition, a behavior could be considered aggressive even if the behavior doesn't necessarily hurt anyone. Rather, what is important is the intent to hurt. For example, if a person threw a beer bottle at someone's head but missed the person she was aiming for, and thus actually didn't hurt the other person, this nevertheless would still be considered aggressive behavior. Also, this definition highlights that any behavior meant to hurt is considered aggressive behavior. People can hurt others physically, as when a guy kicks another guy in the gut, and verbally, such as when a person calls someone a derogatory name. While physical aggression hurts the body, verbal aggression hurts people's self-esteem and senses of worth. In short, aggressive behavior is any behavior that is meant to hurt another, whether this hurt consists of physical or psychological hurt. Social psychologists tend to distinguish between two types of aggression, instrumental aggression and hostile aggression. Instrumental aggression is aggressive behavior performed to attain a non-aggressive goal. With instrumental aggression, hurting someone is a means to reach some goal. An example of instrumental aggression is when a mugger punches a guy on the street so that he can take his wallet. The mugger didn't punch the guy just to hurt him. Rather, the mugger punched the guy so that he could get his wallet. 
Hostile aggression, on the other hand, is aggressive behavior that is impulsive, performed simply to harm another person, and motivated by feel negative feelings. With hostile aggression, hurting someone is the actual goal, and the motivation behind it is anger, not goal-oriented calculation. An example of hostile aggression is when a person verbally insults another person because of feelings of anger. Why do social psychologists make the distinction between instrumental and hostile aggression? There are two related reasons. First, the distinction between instrumental and hostile aggression highlights that aggressive behavior can have different motivations. On the one hand, the motivation behind instrumental aggressive behavior is goal-based. People perform aggressive behavior in order to get something not related to hurting someone, such as when a person stabs a woman in order to take her purse. On the other hand, the motivation behind hostile aggressive behavior is emotion-based. In particular, it is motivated by the emotion of anger. Also, social psychologists make the distinction between instrumental and hostile aggression because the two types call for different interventions for pre preventing or lessening aggressive behavior. For example, if people are being instrumentally aggressive and beating each other up for money, then the best intervention may be getting people more money, perhaps by improving the economy in an area so that people have more jobs. However, if people are being hostily aggressive and beating each other up because of anger, then giving people the opportunity to make money probably won't help much in preventing or lessening this type of aggressive behavior. So over the years, social psychologists have hypothesized several factors that cause or influence aggressive behavior. Social psychologists are interested in discovering the factors that cause or influence aggressive behavior because this knowledge would have potentially large and important social policy implications. If social psychologists can discover the reasons why people act aggressively, then perhaps policymakers can develop social policies for lessening aggressive behavior in society as a whole. Now, although social psychologists have hypothesized a vast number of factors that they believe cause or influence aggressive behavior, I'm going to talk about nine in this lecture. Instincts, frustration, social learning, culture, gender, pain and stress, aggressive objects, obeying authority, and scapegoating and dehumanization. The first factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is instincts. The instinctual theory of aggression was one of the earliest in social psychology. Basically, social psychologists who believed that aggression was instinctual argued that humans are born with a tendency to be aggressive. For example, the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud believed that all humans are born with the instinct to love as well as an instinct to destroy. He believed that both of these instincts demanded release, so to speak. Freud believed that people released their instinct to love through close and sexual relationships. And he believed that people released their instinct to destroy through performing aggressive acts against others and on material objects. Evolutionary social psychologists also believed that an aggressive instinct evolved in humans because it helped early humans survive. These social psychologists argued that early humans who were motivated to be aggressive succeeded better in obtaining and maintaining desirable mating partners, defending their young from predators and other humans, and obtaining and maintaining resources necessary for survival. Social psychologists who argue that aggressive behavior is instinctual often offer examples of behavior from animals that are genetically similar to humans as evidence for their argument. For example, aggressive behavior is common in most mammals. Mammals behave aggressively against each other for territory, for mates, and to protect their offspring. Furthermore, one of humans' closest genetic relatives, the chimpanzee, is highly aggressive. It is the only non-human species in which groups of male members hunt and kill other members of their own kind. Some biologists have found that chimps kill each other at about the same rate that humans and hunter-gatherer societies do. Many social psychologists, however, don't agree that aggression is instinctual in humans. 
Although social psychologists have criticized this argument in a number of ways, two of these criticisms are particularly damning to this explanation. One major problem with the aggression as instinct argument is that aggression is not universal amongst human societies. A defining characteristic of an instinct is that it can be found in all the members of a particular species. For instance, most snake species have the instincts to hunt small vermin for food. If a particular snake species, you would not find that some have the instinct and others do not. Rather, all the members of the species would have this instinct. Of course, humans have some instincts. For example, humans have the instinct to eat. And it's an instinct because it is universal amongst all humans. It is hard to make the claim, however, that aggression is universal amongst all humans. For instance, anthropologists and other social scientists have documented a number of societies where members don't seem to act aggressively whatsoever. Furthermore, anthropologists and historians have shown that tendencies to act aggressively can vary tremendously between time and place. For example, consider the Iroquois, an American Indian tribe that resided in and around what is now upstate New York. Historians have shown that the Iroquois lived peacefully as a hunting and gathering society for centuries, rarely fighting with neighboring tribes. But in the 17th century, the fur trade with Europeans brought the Iroquois in direct competition with the neighboring Hurons. A series of battles between the Iroquois and the Hurons ensued, and within a short amount of time, the Iroquois developed into ferocious warriors. If aggression were instinctual amongst humans, social scientists would not see such a large difference in aggressive behavior between societies or within the same society at different points in time. Another major problem with the aggression as instinct argument is that aggression is not periodic amongst humans. All instincts are periodic, which means that the instinctual drive increases when an organism experiences deprivation and decreases when the instinct is satisfied. For instance, when people have eaten, haven't eaten food in a while, they experience hunger. However, after they have eaten, they no longer experience hunger. This isn't the case with aggression. Social psychologists do not find that the tendency to behave aggressively decreases after behaving aggressively, nor have they found that the want or need to behave aggressively increases in people if they haven't behaved aggressively in a long time. In fact, as we'll learn in a bit, it seems that acting aggressively actually increases the chances of acting aggressively in the future. The second factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is frustration. In fact, one of the earliest social psychological explanations for aggressive behavior was the frustration aggression hypothesis. According to the frustration aggression hypothesis, every act of aggression is due to some sort of frustration, and every frustration leads to some form of aggression. Frustration causes aggression because frustration leads people to experience anger, and this anger motivates people to take actions against the persons, the, th the things, and the situations that they believe are causing them frustration. Good examples of this might be the person who hits his television set because it isn't working correctly, or when a person slaps another across the face because this person has taken money from her, which can be quite frustrating. The original frustration aggression hypothesis, however, has not stood the test of time. This is because subsequent social psychological research found two major problems with the original hypothesis. The first major problem with the original frustration aggression hypothesis is that not all experiences of frustration lead to aggressive behavior. This is for a variety of reasons. For example, people may not act aggressively when frustrated due to the fear of being punished for acting aggressively. Also, social psychologists have found that people respond to frustration in a variety of ways. Some people get depressed, some people get anxious, and some people react by doing no nothing at all and just going about their daily lives.
Given the problems with the original frustration-aggression hypothesis, social psychologists now argue that frustration can lead to aggression, but only in certain situations. Social psychologists find that frustration can lead to aggressive behavior when one or more of the following three conditions are met. First, frustration can lead to aggressive behavior when the frustration experienced is particularly strong. This was shown in a field experiment where the experimenter had an actor cutting lines at theaters, restaurants, and grocery stores. The actor cut in front of either the second person in line or the twelfth person in line. And observers recorded the reactions of the person the actor cut in front of. The experimenter found that people at the front of the line responded far more aggressively and made twice as many abusive and derogatory remarks to the line cutter than people who were twelfth in line. The experimenter argued that these results show the importance of the strength of frustration for predicting when people will act aggressively. A person at the front of the line is about to obtain their goal, and thus a line cutter would be, for them, a particularly strong frustrator. A line cutter for the twelfth person in line is also frustrating, but it's less annoying, less anger-inducing. These differences in the strength of frustration lead to differences in aggressive behavior. Second, people are likely to act aggressively when frustrated if they believe the frustration is unprovoked or done on purpose. This was shown in an experiment where the experimenters asked students to make appeals for a charity over the phone. The experimenters purposely frustrated the students by having the people the students call for donations, who were actually actors, refused to give donations. Some participants experienced legitimate frustration, where potential donors offered good reasons for not being able to donate, such as being currently unemployed. Other participants experienced illegitimate frustration, where potential donors offered weak excuses for not donating, such as saying that charities are rip-offs or just saying that they didn't want to donate. The experimenters found that participants who experienced Ill illegitimate frustration were more verbally aggressive toward the potential donors, and they also hung up the phone with a harder force than people who experienced legitimate frustration. This was done back in the 80s when they still had landlines, and people still actually hung up the phone. In short, people are frustrated all the time, but people tend to act aggressively when they believe the frustration is on purpose, not by accident or because of extenuating circumstances beyond the frustrating person's control. Third, people are more likely to aggress against others who frustrate them if they believe these others cannot retaliate. When people are frustrated by people they don't think can or will retaliate, they are more likely to act aggressively than when they believe people can or will retaliate. It is easy for a person to slam the phone on somebody that has frustrated them because the person on the other end of the line can't retaliate immediately. However, retaliating against the starting linebacker of the Chicago Bears or the Green Bay Packers is a different situation altogether. That is, if Clay Matthews cut in line for tickets to the next Rihanna or Black Keys concert, most people would not react aggressively toward him. Some social psychologists have taken the idea from the frustration-aggression hypothesis that frustration leads to anger, which in turn motivates aggression to the next level. They have done so by arguing that any negative emotion, including anger, fear, sadness, embarrassment, and jealousy, can lead to aggressive behavior. For example, a person might act aggressively towards someone because that person made him angry by frustrating him and another person might act aggressively toward a person because she feels jealous of this person. According to this perspective, which is called the aversive emotional arousal hypothesis, people act aggressively against others in order to reduce their feelings of negative emotions. This is because aggressive behavior attacks the source of the negative emotions, such as when a person punches a guy for embarrassing him, another person slaps another for stealing her boyfriend, and another person cusses out the table that he stubbed his toe on in the middle of the night. 
Also, acting aggressively is a way that the person vents these negative emotions, so to speak, such as when a person punches a punching bag because of the anger he feels towards his boss. The third factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is social learning. Many social psychologists argue that aggressive behavior is behavior that is basically learned from others. Just as people learn from others that two plus two equals four, how to cook an egg, and what to do on a first date, people also learn when and how to act aggressively by observing and interacting with others. According to social psychologists, social learning of aggression occurs in three ways. Modeling, instrumental conditioning, and the learning of aggressive scripts. The first way that people learn when and how to act aggressively is through modeling. Modeling, as you'll hopefully remember, is learning behavior by observing and imitating the behavior of others. Basically, social psychologists have found that people, especially children, model the aggressive behavior they witness. The modeling effect on aggressive behavior was shown in a series of experiments where the researchers had children watch someone or something act aggressively against a Bobo blow-up doll. In some situations, they watched a person in real life act aggressively toward the Bobo doll. In some cases, the children watched a videotape of someone acting aggressively toward a Bobo doll. And in others, the children watched a cartoon version of someone attacking a Bobo doll. After watching the aggressive models, the, ch the kids were put in a room alone with various toys, including poor old Bobo. I've put a clip on Blackboard uh, with the original experimenter, Albert Bandura, talking about this experiment. And it also has uh, some clips that they recorded of the children playing alone uh, in the rooms after watching these models. Uh, when you find time, please watch that clip and uh, get a little more perspective. Overall, though, the researchers found that children who saw someone acting aggressively against the bubble doll were also much more aggressive toward the bubble doll than the children who did not see anyone acting aggressively toward the doll. As you see here, the number of uh, acts of aggression uh, when the model was live, that they actually were in the same room as them, uh, was close about 21. The video, when they watched the person being aggressive on a videotape, it's about 16. When they watched a cartoon being aggressive against the Bobo doll, that was still very much higher than the control here, which is not seeing an aggressive model at all. Social psychologists argue that witnessing an aggressive model increases people's likelihood of future aggressive behavior in three ways. First, models demonstrate possible aggressive behaviors to others. That is, models show people how aggressive acts are done. For example, in the case of the bubble doll study, children learned from the models that they could hit, kick, and throw the bubble doll. Second, models demonstrate when aggressive behavior is appropriate. That is, models show people when and where aggressive behavior is the proper and right thing to do. For example, in the case of the bubble doll study, the models taught the children that they could be aggressive to the bubble doll when they played with it. Third, models demonstrate the consequences of aggressive behavior. That is, they show people when aggression is rewarded and when aggression is punished. For example, in one version, of the bubble doll experiment, the researchers had children watch a model either being rewarded or punished for acting aggressively against the bubble doll. The researchers found that children who saw the person rewarded for acting aggressively were much more likely to act aggressively than children who saw the person being punished for acting aggressively. The second way that people learn when and how to act aggressively is through instrumental conditioning. Social psychologists argue that people also learn aggressive behavior by being rewarded for aggressive behavior and or not punished when they behave aggressively. 
Learning aggressive behavior through instrumental conditioning happens both directly and indirectly. Directly, people themselves can be rewarded and punished for aggressive behavior. For example, if a person punches somebody out and gets his money and receives absolutely no punishment for this, he is much more likely to punch other guys out and take their money in the future. Indirectly, people learn that aggressive behavior is either rewarded or punished as I just discussed. The third way that people learn when and how to act aggressively is through the learning of what social psychologists call aggressive scripts. Aggressive scripts are cognitive scripts that emphasize aggressive behaviors in particular situations and to respond to particular problems. As you'll hopefully remember, scripts are schemas that tell people how to act in particular social situations. Basically, aggressive scripts are types of scripts that tell people that they should act aggressively in a particular situation. An example of an aggressive script would be, if a person makes fun of me, I am supposed to punch this person in retaliation. People learn aggressive scripts from their social environments. For example, aggressive scripts are often learned from significant others as when a young boy learns from watching his abusive father that if my wife hollers at me, I should hit her to get her to stop. One of the main sources of aggressive scripts in contemporary society is the mass media. According to social psychologists, violent television programs and video games increase aggressive behavior because they teach people aggressive scripts. For example, watching the Three Stooges teaches children that an appropriate response to an annoying person is to bop them on the head. Many television programs, especially ones catering to children, feature characters who frequently act aggressively. It is estimated that by age 18, the average American child has seen around 200,000 violent acts on television, including 40,000 homicides. Also, 58% of all TV programs contain violence, and 78% of shows with violence do not show remorse, criticism, or any penalty for the violence. This graph represents the results of a content analysis of various types of aggressive behavior in children's television shows and primetime shows, which usually cater to adults. As you can see here, children's shows have more violent characters, more victims of violence, and even slightly more killings than primetime television shows. Also, many video games, such as Mortal Kombat, God of War, and the various Grand Theft Autos, are filled with extreme acts of aggression. According to consumer surveys, these types of video games are also the most popular. Some of these video games have been deemed so violent that some governments have actually banned them from being sold in their countries. Some believe that watching violent television programs and playing violent video games really doesn't lead to aggressive behavior. Rather, it is aggressive, aggressive people are attracted to these types of games and programs. Social psychologists, however, have provided evidence that violent television programs and video games do cause people to act aggressively. For example, in one experiment, the researcher had children watch either a violent television police program or a nonviolent sporting event. Each child was then allowed to play in another room with a group of other children. The researchers found that those who watched the violent police program were far more aggressive toward their playmates than those who had just watched the nonviolent sporting event. Watching violent television doesn't just affect children's aggressive behavior, it also affects adults' aggressive behavior. For example, one social psychologist conducted a longitudinal study where she monitored the behavior of more than 700 families over a period of 17 years. She found a significant association between the amount of time spent watching television and adult aggressive behavior, with those who watched a lot of TV more likely to act aggressively than those who watched little or no TV.
The association was significant regardless of education level, family income, and neighborhood violence. Also, in an experiment investigating the impact of playing violent video games on aggressive behavior, the researchers had participants play either a violent or a nonviolent video game for 30 minutes. After the participants played these video games, the researchers asked the participants to write down what they were thinking. The researchers found that those who played the violent video game listed more aggressive thoughts than those who played the nonviolent video game. The researchers weren't done, however. They also had the participants return one week later and have them play these same games for another 15 minutes. The researchers then had each participant play a competitive reaction time task with another participant. After each trial, the faster person could direct an extremely loud blast of noise and aggressive behavior at the slower person. And they got to choose how long they blasted this very loud uh, blast of noise. The researchers found that those who played the violent video game directed louder blasts against the losers than those who had played a nonviolent video game. The fourth factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is culture. Several social psychologists argue that particular cultures and subcultures are more prone to aggressive behavior than others. This is usually due to a variety of historical factors that have made aggression in these cultures and subcultures necessary, acceptable, and taken for granted. One culture that several social psychologists have argued is quite aggressive is the culture of honor in the U.S. South. A key aspect of cultures of honor is the importance placed on responding aggressively to insults in order to protect one's reputation. According to social psychologists, violent cultures of honor, such as the one that exists in the U.S. South, are more likely to occur when certain factors in the social environment are present. First, violent cultures of honor are more likely to develop in social environments where individuals are at economic risk from others. In other words, these cultures are more likely to develop in environments where people are always stealing from other people. Second, violent cultures of honor are more likely to develop in social environments where governments are non-existent and can't prevent or punish theft. The social environment of the antebellum or pre-Civil War U.S. South had both of these characteristics. The U.S. South was primarily settled by herders from Scotland, Ireland, and Wales who were constantly at risk from others. Herders are often the victims of theft from other herders in any society where herding is prominent. Sheep and cattle, especially when not branded, are easily stolen if not watched on a constant basis. Also, in the antebellum U.S. South, governments were very weak. Sheriffs, constables, and other law enforcement officials were few and far between in this social environment. According to social psychologists, living in these conditions causes a culture of honor to develop. This is because people who live in these conditions find it necessary to show toughness so that they will not be exploited by others trying to steal their herds and other economic resources. If a person's got a reputation for being a guy who will cut somebody's head off for looking at him cross-eyed, then people will think twice from stealing a sheep or two from him. Thus, when someone does insult a person in this context and the person doesn't retaliate, it will affect his reputation, making people think that he's weak and he can, take, he can be taken advantage of. Thus, the tendency to react aggressively to insults was a matter of keeping one reputation as a person who shouldn't be messed with. Now, although economic and social changes occurred years ago in the U.S. South, the culture of honor nevertheless remains. 
This is an example of what anthropologists call cultural lag. Even though the context that gave rise to this particular culture changed, the culture has remained. And there is a large body of evidence for the violent culture of honor in the U.S. South. In particular, there is much evidence that Southerners are more likely to respond to insults with aggressive behavior than non-Southerners. For example, consider homicide rates. When collecting data on homicides, the FBI often collects information about the context of the homicide, such as if the homicide happened during an argument, during a robbery, or what have you. As you can see from this graph, argument-related murders, that is, murders that occur because of an argument, are significantly more likely in the South than in the non-South. However, the geographic trend reverses for felony-related murders, that is, murders that occur during the course of committing another felony, such as robbery or rape. This is evidence for the Southern culture of honor, since many ar arguments often begin with insults. And if this data is any indication, Southerners are more likely to respond with lethal violence to these arguments than non-Southerners. Surveys also show that Southerners are more likely to approve of a person kicking a drunk person's butt for bumping into him and his wife than non-Southerners are. This shows that Southerners are more likely to interpret events as a threat to their honors or reputations. And because of this, people who feel that a situation is a threat to them will respond aggressively. The fifth factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is gender. There are several ways that gender influences aggressive behavior. For one, social psychologists find that men and women tend to behave aggressively in different ways. Men tend to be more physically aggressive than women, while women tend to be more verbally aggressive than men. For example, a man is more likely to respond to an insult by punching a guy, while a woman is more likely to respond to an insult by verbally insulting the insulter or starting a vicious rumor about the person that insulted them. There is cross-cultural evidence for this trend. Using data from adolescents from Finland, Israel, Italy, and Poland, social psychologists have found that verbal aggression was more prevalent among females across nations, ethnic groups, and particular age groups. On the other hand, males were more likely to use physical aggression than females were. A common assumption in popular culture is that men are more aggressive in general than women. And another common assumption is that this difference in aggression is due to differences in the amount of the male hormone testosterone men and women have. On average, men have 10 times the amount of testosterone in their bloodstreams than women. Some scientists argue that testosterone causes aggressive behavior. It is thought that this hormone causes people to be more aggressive because laboratory studies with animals show that animals with much testosterone in their bloodstreams are more aggressive than animals with less testosterone. However, social psychologists question the assumption that testosterone causes aggressive behavior. For example, some studies find that testosterone actually increases after aggressive acts. That is, several studies have shown that participating in aggressive acts increases the levels of blood testosterone for both men and women. So high testosterone levels come after aggressive behavior, not before. Thus, the causal relationship between aggressive behavior and testosterone actually might be reversed. It is not testosterone that causes aggressive behavior. It is aggressive behavior that causes increases in testosterone. Also, according to some social psychologists, testosterone increases when people feel they're in physical danger or if their status is threatened. 
This increase in testosterone makes people more prepared to act aggressively. Thus, it is not testosterone that makes people, particularly men, aggressive in and of itself. Rather, it has more to do with particular situations and whether men interpret situations as dangerous and status-threatening. It may just be the case that men are more likely to view a situation as, less, as more threatening to them than women are. Some social psychologists have also argued that when controlling for experiences of frustration, the differences in aggression between men and women decreases significantly. This suggests that differences in aggressive behavior between men and women are due to different definitions of the situation that men and women have for particular situations. Men are probably more likely to interpret ambiguous situations as more threatening and provocative than they actually are. And thus, they are more likely to react aggressively in these situations than women are. A good example of this is road rage. Many men seem to regard being cut off in traffic as a personal insult or a threat to their masculinity. And in situations like this, men will often respond aggressively. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to take these situations in stride. In regards to differences in types of aggressive behavior between men and women, most social psychologists believe that this is due to differences in gender socialization. For example, boys in the U.S. are socialized to be active and girls are socialized to be passive. This translates, according to many, into differences in the type of aggression used. Since boys are socialized to be active, they are more likely to be physically aggressive. And since girls are socialized to be passive, they are more likely to be verbally aggressive. Some evolutionary social psychologists, however, believe that gender differences in types of aggression are due to different evolutionary pressures experienced by men and women. For example, ancestral males who were more physically aggressive were able to fend off sexual competitors and keep other potential sexual competitors at bay. Because these early human males were more likely to pass on their genes to the next generation, males today are more likely to be physically aggressive. On the other hand, evolutionary social psychologists argue that women are more verbally aggressive because it helped ancestral females fend off sexual rivals. According to this argument, ancestral females used verbal aggression against other females to make these females seem less attractive to desirable males. Women calling each other fat or flat-chested or spreading rumors about sexual promiscuity of other women make these other women seem less attractive and, by doing so, makes themselves seem more attractive. Because verbal aggression helped ancestral females win, so to speak, better mates, they were more likely to pass their genes on into the next generation. Because of this, females today tend to act more verbally aggressive than men do. The sixth factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is pain and stress. Social psychologists find that experiences of pain often lead people to act aggressively. In one experiment, for example, participants who were made to experience pain acted more aggressively toward other students when given the chance. In another experiment, people placed in a very hot room to take a test acted more aggressively toward other students when given the chance. There's also real-world evidence that pain increases aggressive behavior. As you can see in this graph, violent crimes and aggressive acts such as rapes, assaults, riots, domestic violence, and even bean balls during a baseball game are more common during the summer than any other time of the year. Some social psychologists have even argued that a big consequence of global warming is that it has caused aggressive behavior to increase around the globe. Thus, global warming may make the world more at risk for everyday violence and perhaps even wars, especially in countries and regions without the technology to control ambient temperatures, such as air conditioners. 
Social psychologists have also found that experiences of stress can lead to aggressive behavior. That is, people who experience high levels of stress are more likely to act aggressively than people experiencing low levels of stress. The effects of stress on aggression can be seen in studies that look at unemployment rates and the perpetration of domestic violence. For example, social psychologists find that as income rises, the frequency of physical violence falls. Also, studies of police reports indicate that domestic violence calls rise on high stress days such as Christmas, Thanksgiving, and at least before the internet, April 15th, the day federal taxes are due. Stress also leads to increased alcohol consumption, and alcohol leads to more aggressive behavior. Alcohol reduces social inhibitions and disrupts people's information processing, both of which can lead to aggressive behavior. For example, when a person's drunk and someone spills a drink on him in a crowded bar, he's more likely to interpret this act as an affront of some kind than as an accident and thus fisticuffs are more likely to ensue when a person is drunk than when he is not. The seventh factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is what social psychologists call aggressive objects. Aggressive objects are objects that are associated with aggressive behavior in a particular society. In contemporary U.S. society, Examples of aggressive objects are handguns and switchblades, since these objects are often involved in aggressive behavior. According to social psychologists, aggressive objects lead to aggressive behavior because of what they call the weapons effect. The weapons effect is when merely being in the presence of an aggressive object increases aggressive behavior. The weapons effect was shown in an experiment where the researchers made participants angry by having a paid actor insult them. One group of the participants was insulted in a room that had a realistic toy gun in it. The researchers said the gun was from a previous experiment done that same day. And another group of participants was insulted in the presence of a badminton racket, an object most people don't associate with aggression. Participants were then given the opportunity to administer electric shocks to a fellow participant. The researchers found that participants made angry in the presence of the gun were significantly more likely to give longer and more intense shocks than those made angry in the presence of the badminton racket. Social psychologists used to believe that the weapon effect occurred because being in the presence of aggressive objects primed aggressive scripts. That is, the sight of an aggressive object makes aggressive scripts for behavior more accessible to people. However, recent social psychological studies suggest that being in the presence of aggressive objects increases aggressive behavior because aggressive objects increase testosterone levels, which in turn causes more aggressive behavior. The possibility that the weapons effect occurs because aggressive objects increase people's levels of testosterone was shown in an experiment where the researchers had male participants play with either a realistic toy gun or a board game. The researchers measured the participants' testosterone levels before and after they played with the toys. Participants then had the opportunity to put hot sauce in a glass of water for another participant, which served as a measure of regression for this experiment. As you can see in this graph, the researchers found that participants who played with a toy gun had higher levels of testosterone, which in turn led them to be more aggressive, as measured by the amount of hot sauce they put in the water for another person to drink. The researchers were able to make this claim because differences in aggressive behavior between the participants who played with a toy gun and those who played with the board game became insignificant with controlling for levels of testosterone. So in other words, it seems that just being in the presence of an aggressive object increases testosterone, which primes people to be ready to be aggressive when given the opportunity.
The eighth factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is obeying authorities who command that people perform aggressive actions toward others. As you learned earlier in this course, people sometimes act aggressively towards others because they are obeying authorities that command them to inflict harm upon others. Aggressive behavior in these cases is instrumental since people are acting aggressively not because the other person has done them wrong in some way, but because they feel compelled to do so because of an authority figure. This was shown by the fact that if people believe it possible, they will disobey the authority so that they do not have to act aggressively. The ninth factor that social psychologists have hypothesized causes or influences aggressive behavior is scapegoating and dehumanization. Social psychologists find that scapegoating, which is the singling out of a particular person or group of people for unwarranted blame, can lead to aggressive behavior. History has shown that the targets of genocides or the systematic extermination of a category of people because of their race, ethnicity, or religion are often scapegoated. For example, consider the Russian programs of, late, of the late 1800s which was a systematic massacre of Jews in Russia. Hundreds of Jews were murdered and many fled to the U.S. and Palestine. This was because Jews were blamed for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1880. Also, the Jewish Holocaust during World War II killed over six million Jews. Jews were targeted because they were blamed for Germany's loss in World War I and the economic misery of Germany after World War I. For example, Adolf Hitler wrote in his memoir, Mein Kampf, quote, his, the Jew, is no master race. He is an exploiter. The Jews are a people of robbers. He has never founded any civilization, though he has destroyed civilizations by the hundred. Everything he has stolen. Foreign people, foreign workmen build him his temples. It is foreigners who create and work for him. It is foreigners who shed their blood for him. Also in 2004 in the nation of Sudan, the Arab militant group called the Janjaweed killed somewhere between 300,000 and 1 million Darfurians. The Janjaweed targeted Darfurians because a few Darfurian rebels uh, attacked the Sudanese government. Social psychologists find that dehumanization, or the asserting the inferiority of a person or group of people, can also lead to aggressive behavior. Dehumanization can happen on many levels, but two are especially important. The first is moral dehumanization, which is when a person or group of people is said to be less than human, so to speak, because they are said to be immoral or amoral without morals. This has happened to blacks in the United States throughout history. Blacks were thought to be less than human because they supposedly did not live up to the moral standards of white middle-class society. This also occurred to the Jews in Europe shortly before World War II. The second type of dehumanization is genetic dehumanization. This is when a person or group of people is said to be less than human because they are biologically inferior to a majority group. Again, this type of dehumanization has happened to peoples of African descent throughout history. Peoples of African descent were thought to be subhumans, and there were various arguments, all of them, of course, false, that justified this stance. As you can probably tell, moral dehumanization and genetic dehumanization often go hand in hand. People who are said to be biologically inferior are often thought to be unable or unwilling to live up to the proper moral standards. Dehumanization makes aggressive behavior easier to do because it causes people to believe that they are not actually hurting an actual human being. If a person thinks that they are harming or even killing someone that isn't actually human, it's a whole lot easier than harming or killing another person that you actually think is human. Groups that are dehumanized also experience genocide. 
For example, the Jews during World War II were thought by the Nazis to be inferior human beings. As this example shows, scapegoating and dehumanization often go hand in hand in causing genocides. Most social psychologists are interested in studying aggressive behavior because they are interested in reducing aggression in society. Aggressive behavior can lead to many negative effects for individuals and groups in society, from a broken nose incurred from a bar fight to the killing of an entire group of people. Given what social psychologists know about aggressive behavior, they use this knowledge to hypothesize several ways that we perhaps can reduce aggressive behavior in society. Punishing aggressive behavior, catharsis, censoring violent media, lessening the presence of aggressive objects, modeling non-aggressive responses to provocation and frustration, and social policies to reduce stress. The first way that we might reduce aggressive behavior is by punishing aggressive behavior. However, social psychologists have found that punishing aggressive behavior with more aggressive behavior often backfires. This is because it is not administered in an effective manner. Social psychologists find that for punishment to be effective in deterring future aggressive behavior, it must be both prompt and it must be certain. For example, if a person commits an aggressive act, for punishment to actually reduce future aggressive behavior on her part, the punishment must occur very soon after she has committed an aggressive act, and the punishment must always come after she has committed an aggressive act. The lack of effective punishment is probably why the death penalty has not worked as a deterrent of crime in the United States. Criminologists have found no impact on having the death penalty on murder rates in particular states. In fact, states in the U.S. and countries around the world that don't have the death penalty actually have some of the lowest murder rates. Some social psychologists have argued that catharsis is a way that we can reduce aggressive behavior in society. Catharsis is the idea that viewing aggressive behavior, performing aggressive behavior, or engaging in fantasy aggression aggression, such as playing violent video games, reduces the likelihood of future aggressive behavior. However, while this idea is popular amongst the general public, social psychologists have found very little evidence that catharsis actually reduces future aggressive behavior. Social psychologists rather have found that viewing aggressive behavior, performing aggressive behavior, and engaging in fantasy aggression actually increases the likelihood of future aggressive behavior. The exact opposite of what the catharsis hypothesis predicts. We could perhaps reduce aggressive behavior by censoring violent media. Censoring violent media would lead to less exposure to violent media, which we've already learned can lead to more aggressive behavior through aggressive modeling and the learning of aggressive scripts. However, at least in the United States, censoring violent media would be very hard to do in regards to adults because of guarantees of free speech. Of course, parental ratings and parental locks on television, V-chips, can help parents prevent their children from consuming media that contains violence. However, attempting children from consuming uh, mass media might be difficult because of psychological reactants. As you'll hopefully remember, psychological reactance is the idea that people resist attempts by others that threaten their sense of independence by doing the opposite of what others try to get them to do. In other words, the more you make violent media harder to get for children and adolescents, the more they might want to try to get it. Some social psychologists say that we can reduce aggressive behavior in society by lessening the presence of aggressive objects in society, especially guns. However, this would be difficult to do in the United States because of the Second Amendment, which most people interpret as giving the right of citizens to own firearms. 
Some social psychologists argue that we can reduce aggressive behavior in society by modeling non-aggressive responses to anger and frustration. Several social psychologists have shown that people will also model non-aggressive responses to anger and frustration. Thus, perhaps there needs to be more television programming that shows children how to respond non-aggressively to anger and frustration. Finally, social policies to reduce stress might be another way to reduce aggressive behavior in society. Given that stress can lead to aggressive behavior, several social psychologists argue that social policies that reduce life stresses could reduce aggressive behavior as well. For example, local, state, and federal governments could start free childcare programs and other social welfare programs that could lessen the economic stresses that many people feel nowadays and in turn, reduce their likelihood of committing aggressive behavior.